Right, the inquiry is resumed. Mr. Fraser. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Pilbert, we got to the issue of the inefficient core arrangement, and uh, you fairly accepted earlier that um, this wasn't, that the reconfiguration of the core wasn't something that you looked at um, back in 2018 when you were doing feasibility studies. We qualified yes to that. We looked at options that can reconfigure the core, we looked at options that we liked to. Uh, once we reconfigure the core, I don't think we ever look to remove every core, as okay. Mr. Serge has suggested. I see. That's, that's, that's fair. Sorry, sorry for misrepresenting. Yeah, 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 sure. um, and you, you said in your evidence in chief that the existing arrangement of the core <coughs> uh, presents difficulties for a light touch refurbishment, yeah. um, but presumably not difficulties for a deep retrofit scheme because in the way that Mr. Sturgis identified, they could be rearranged. I think that's correct. And I identified that we're talking about about 16, 16.1% of the floor plate to remove all those perimeter cores. Mm. And then to construct a central core, and he and I are aligned that that's the right configuration, yeah. another 11%, total 27%. Yeah. So the, the concern you have about that part of the deep retrofit scheme is, isn't so much about issues of quality or feasibility, but more you say, well, that's going to have a significant embodied carbon. That's your vision. Yeah. I was struck yesterday's opening remarks characterised retrofit as low carbon and new build as high carbon. Um, and I thought that was uh, simplistic and that effectively we're discussing Shades of grey, mm. the deep cut and carb retrofit can be associated with relatively high embodied carbon and on the beneficial side, lower operational carbon. A new build will, I think, I would accept in most cases, be higher embodied carbon, mm. but it's a question of degree and it will deliver lower operational carbon. In this case, it will also deliver fit for purpose uh, space for MS and it will optimise the site's development potential. Looking at the Sturgis scheme as a whole, and I appreciate that you have all the points that you want to make about um, yeah. uh, whether it will deliver sufficient quality and so on. But looking at it as a whole, I mean, no, nobody's done a whole life carbon assessment of the Sturgis scheme. But you presumably would have disagreed with Mr. Sturgis when he says at paragraph 3.7.3.3 of his rebuttal that. The, the total CO2E for his scheme is going to be lower than the new build scheme which you presented. I think that's correct. And I, I would say it's correct because the building is significantly smaller. And that's an important qualification because we go to the point about optimising sites with the highest level of public transport infrastructure. I wasn't being flippant when I remarked that the Elizabeth line has been associated with vast amounts of body of carbon and yeah. it's an investment in public transport accessibility. It's only an investment that makes sense if we can optimise development around it. So total number lower. The number per square metre I think needs to be studied but they're not going to be radically different. Okay. All right. So you wouldn't say um, in Mr Sturgis's words Okay, so so I understand that. So so ultimately, what you're suggesting is that there's a trade-off to be had between uh, additional floor space and embodied carbon. Yes, is the price worth it? Essentially. Yes. Yeah, I believe it is, but but that's the debate. You do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and your position in respect of per square meter yeah. is that. Mr. Sturgis's scheme will have a lower per square metre CO2e, but not radically different. Yeah, I'm going to come back to my shades of grey. Uh, I've, I've shown you Kensington, 700 kilograms of carbon per square metre. I've shown you our proposal for 458 Oxford Street, which yeah. at stage two is 653. Mm. 
However, I haven't measured uh, Mr. Surgis's scheme, and I don't know if it would be the same as Kensington. I, you know, he's not proposing the facade replacement we did on Kensington, so that would be to its credit. But on the other hand, he's proposing more structural work. Get it. So it isn't calculated, but I think they would be in not dissimilar ranges. Right. Okay. But lower. I, I, I would accept that I think it would be lower embodied and higher operational. OK. I mean, obviously, in locations where existing fabric is being removed, there are, for example, the perimeter cores, as you say, that, and indeed new fabric being inserted in places, there is going to be localised higher carbon activity. But overall, there's nothing like the scale of demolishing an entire building and building a completely new building in its place. I think it's just not comparable scale. The inspector took the time to, to look over the Kensington building. The figures I presented have been audited and they're correct for 700 kilograms of carbon. And, you know, uh, Mr. Sturgis was critical of that number. And, and we can debate whether it was, you know, optimised or not. But that was factually the, the number that was associated with that, that deep cut and carbon refurbishment. And I just remarked that is the services proposals are more structurally invasive than what we've done at Kensington, with the important exception that he's not proposing the side replacement. So, I mean, those those are the, 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 the facts as I see them. I mean, the problem we have, Mr. Philbro, with, with the Kensington building example, which you have repeatedly referred to, is, is that we, we have no information in relation to the Kensington building to be able to actually engage in a meaningful comparison. Do we? nor do we have any information about what a new build of the Kensington building might have looked like. So we can't do the whole new build versus retrofit right. comparison. Yeah. I mean, that, that's two fundamental limitations yes. on yeah. with the weights that the inspector can attach to your evidence about the Kensington building, aren't they? Yes, and, and I all I'm, and I don't want to take comparison too far. All I'm saying is in my personal and professional experience, the deep cut and carbon refurbishment will have significant embodied carbon investment. It's maybe the right thing to do. It is in all likelihood will be lower than the new build, but it won't be de minimis. We'll be talking about a grey shade between two levels of embodied carbon investment. And, and I'm struck that Mr. Sturgis believes that fully a quarter of the building, an existing building that he seeks to keep, Fully a quarter of that building is wrong and needs to be remade. And that's a very, very substantial acknowledgement of a problem in the existing fabric. Well, Mr. Pilbara, at the risk of stating the obvious, a quarter is only 25% of the totality of the building, which is what you're suggesting has to be demolished and rebuilt. So it's a significant difference between a quarter and one, <coughs> isn't it? But you would expect me to come back and say two things. Firstly, the quality of space that results remains substandard, remains, I believe, unviable. Secondly, the quantum of development is significantly under the site's capacity, objectively under the site's capacity and, and, and under by 25%. So I think it fails on both those measures. The, the the issue to do with the quality of what can be achieved with a retrofit is obviously one of the many issues that the inspector is going to need to consider. Um, if we just think about your this comparison between the additional space, that's something that you've said that it, it is a shortcoming of the retrofit, that it's not going to be able to achieve the same quantum of additional space that uh, that your new build scheme achieves. You, you said in uh, evidence in chief, you, you mentioned a figure of 74, 76%, I think. So let's just call that 75%. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that, forgive me, is that taking into account the additional floor space that Mr. Sturgis has identified over and above the Arab feasibility? Because you fairly accepted that you yeah. could have additional floor space to the rear. Yeah. On Portland Muse. So, um, and to be super clear on Portland Muse, Arabs are saying you can add a floor, and that's reflected in the number that I reported. Yeah. The diagram that 
that we made, not our drawing, showed us extending 23 Orchard Street. It didn't show us extending 10 Portman Mews, and that was our error. Um, so we can extend to 10 Portman Mews by a floor, switching retail to office, taking the benefit of the light load. The numbers, let's just rehearse them. So the existing building circa 35,000 square meters GIA, the proposal 60,777 meters GIA, should we call it circa 61. Yeah. If you extend Neil House by three floors and Orchard House by two floors and 10 Portman Mews by one floor, and you then do a measure, you come to a number of 47,000 square meters. And so I'm comparing that maximized refurbishment scheme, 47,000 square meters, with the site potential of circa 61,000 square meters. That's my three quarters measure. Okay. And that, that that difference, the difference there, the, the, the three quarters, there's obviously a difference in terms of um, how much benefit can be provided by what can be occupying yeah. those yeah. Additions, that additional yeah. floor space. But there are, of course, other considerations, the embodied carbon being one, heritage implications being another. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're all different factors that compete. Yeah. So yeah. not necessarily always the case is that additional floor space is, the, is better. Yeah. Than uh, as I said in my opening remarks, one of the pleasures but also challenges of being an architect is you have to balance up all of those considerations, mm -hmm. heritage, sustainability, policy, climate brief, etc. Uh, I think we would sought to do that on, on, on this site as we would always do it on a case-by-case -case basis the merits of the site, the existing building, and, uh, and, and, and its potential. Um, we can say, though, I think with some confidence, given that the massing was suggested by the local authority, has been supported both by local authority and by the mayor's office, that that is an appropriate response to the site. That seems fairly uncontroversial <coughs> given the scale of other galleons along, along Oxford Street. So, yes, I think the planning context suggests strongly that <coughs> 61,000, 60,777 square meters is the site's development potential. And it seems fairly uncontroversial to me to say that that cannot be delivered in the refurbishment. Um, I, I, that's at least how I see things. The, the additional space, if there were to be additional space added to the existing building in the way that Mr. Sturgis uh, envisages, all of that additional space could carry with it and include the 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 innovations the, the the innovations that you have explained in your presentation to do with the new those, those sorts of innovations like roof the roof gardens for yeah. example all of that could be done in the context of an existing refurbishment yeah no i, I think you would expect that the, the new space and just to sort of put this in scale that's about between 10 and 12,000 square meters, 35,000 square meters on the, on the site. I think you would want to deliver that to that, that caliber and quality, yes. Yeah, and that would, of course, increase the viability as well. Yeah, and, and look, I'm not expert in the numbers, just no. in my experience, the sort of quantum we achieve is a 50% increase on, on case and is sort of what you need to do, but that's probably for others than I'm sure. not the best witness of. Course. No, I, I appreciate that, <clears throat> but it's, um, it's clear that high quality space, whatever use, presumably offices, could be provided um, by way of additional floor space, achieving all of the same benefits that you rely on if you want to build it. And I don't know the percentage would be saying it's it's 10,000 and 35, so it's, it's a quarter of the space could be of good quality. Okay, so it's the other part that we're disagreeing on in terms of quality. Yeah. Okay. Planned design life, design, um, issues of design life. Can I just pick up on something that you dealt with? Mr. Sturgis deals with this as well. Um, at 3.4.1.4 of Mr. Sturgis's rebuttal. I'm sorry, that was a very long reference. No, 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 that's how it comes. <laughs> I'm not a number of proof. <laughs> Lesson number one. Well, we, let's not get on to the drawing numbers. <laughs> okay. So, apologies, Chris, do that for me again. Three point. So, the rebuttal of Mr. Sturgeon. Yeah. Uh, page 14, 3.4.1.4. Oh, 
Information on cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Where Mr. Yeah. Sturgis says that the statement that these buildings are approaching the end of their planned design life is pure speculation, and given their respective ages, 92, 49, and 42 years, is an inaccurate statement. To be demolishing buildings that remain viable and in two cases are less than 50 years old is counter to any claims to resource or carbon efficiency. You agree? I think walking around the site yesterday reminded us that the, that the buildings need love and care at a minimum, I'm sure. So, for example, the services are now uh, nearing the end of their, of their life. The facades are grossly inefficient. And I think, again, there's common ground between us that we would, we would definitely need to, to upgrade those. Mm. Uh, I think the structure of the building is, is in good state. Okay. I don't think there's a problem. Well, and I'm happy to agree with that. That's yeah. very fair, because yeah. that's what I was about to okay. get at, that yeah. there are inevitably yeah. going to be things that yeah. need to be replaced in the building periodically. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. So with that in mind, what Mr. Sturgis goes on to say at 3.4.3.1, that there's this, there's your reference to the new build having a design life of 120 years. Yes. He says that's, that's, in his words, highly misleading because, okay, sure, just in the way that the existing structure of Orchard House uh, doesn't, isn't approaching the end of its design life, that may be the case for, um, structural frame of your new building, but eventually there are going to be other elements that periodically need to be refurbished in exactly the same way as would be the case for a refurbish. You don't disagree? Yeah, no, I don't disagree. In fact, Simon and I sort of agree on this point um, in that I think our whole life carbon assessment that sort of the RICS methodology and has suggested the replacement of that rather handsome brick and stone facade I was showing this morning on a 25 year cycle. Indeed, when we report the whole life carbon numbers, we assume it's replaced at 25 years and again at 50 years. Yeah. It's absurd. I mean, we will look to Davis Street. The building is now 25 years old. The facade is in impeccable condition. The buildings we design and specify last. So that's a point where Simon said it was absurd and I, I, I agree. We're following, it. We're following a methodology, but to be honest with you, it's pessimistic on that side. Um, why then is the new building going to have a, a better character? You're saying the building is, I'm agreeing, the building is not, the current building is not falling down. Yeah. Why I think the new building is better from a circular economy standpoint is it has generous, robust dimension that will facilitate its use and reuse, its accommodation of retail and its changing trends, its accommodation of office and different uses over time. In, in a far more flexible way than is possible in the existing building. The existing three buildings, remember, which are all of different dates and, 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 and inevitably compromised in terms of their interrelationship, contrast that with a single building with generous, more generous floor to ceiling heights, more efficient facades, more open structure. Mm. I think that has a long term legacy benefit over the refurbishment. In terms of flexibility, as opposed to design life, if you could call it that, in the sense that it would still be possible to, in a refurbishment scheme, to have, to, to put in windows, for example, that would last just as long as windows in a new building. I, I think we would deliver in a new building a higher calibre of facade, and let me explain that. And I tried to do so this morning. Uh, we're designing a facade in tandem with Arabs that optimizes the performance of the envelope. So it maximizes daylight while minimizing unwanted so gain. That's not possible in the context of the existing building. And when we deliver it, we'll deliver it to high environmental standards, the correct U values, the correct G values, the correct air infiltration. We will avoid the cold bridges that are everywhere in the existing building. With respect, I don't think you would achieve that caliber of performance in a refurbishment. I'm not precluding a refurbishment in any case, but in this case, it won't be as good. Could that same analysis be applied to the the disagreement between you in respect of services. So 
Mr. Sergis has said in his rebuttal that any major refurb would replace all the services, rationalize them, modernize them, and yeah. so on. Um, I mean, it sounds like you accept that that's the case, yeah, but so it's not necessarily. We wanted to do the services, and we would both agree you'd move to an all electric system. You yeah. get rid of the gas fired boilers that exist in the current building, which yeah. are high carbon and all of that. Yes, they'd absolutely agree. And so that it sounds like actually this isn't a question about won't be as good or caliber of performance, but rather not an obstacle at all. Services yeah. could be easily, easily achieved to the same quality. Precisely what you do in a new building, you could do in a repo. Not precisely. I, I, I want to drive into some detail here. I think the basic services, I think we can agree. I think the envelope we've covered, and I've said that I don't believe the refurbishment envelope would deliver the same quality of environmental performance. I touched this morning on how we're going to do the servicing in the proposed new building, and it's a displacement ventilation system uh, where air is drawn from the floor and we use the height in the floor, um, uh, the 3.2 metre clear height, to stratify the, the, the so we're temporary the occupied zone and the hot air rises on that edge. Now, displacement is demonstrably lower energy. Displacement allows us to utilise free cooling for much of the year. We're bringing the air in at 16 degrees, so we don't need to chill it down as you do in a high level uh, uh, air system. Uh, and therefore, it's lower uh, operational energy. It's also got proven health and well-being benefits because you're not swirling the air around. If you have fan coil units at high level, you're pushing the air down, you mix it around the room. And if you, for example, someone has a cold, everyone has a cold by the end of the day. The displacement is is uh, basically much quieter, much less mixing. Quieter is another thing, it, it, of course, if it's cold, you, it, it's, it's quiet, you don't need the, the fan coils uh, operating and all the energy associated with those. So um, the other thing that displacement lets us do is it works really well with mixed mode and we can open the window and, 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 and utilise free cooling in mid-season. Um, displacement, though, is quite difficult to do in a refurbishment where you're locked into the existing sill heights of the windows because you need a very tall raised floor. Displacement is quite do, quite tough to do when you're locked into existing cores with thresholds and stairs that are to, to floor level. So I'm not precluding it as impossible, but it's definitely difficult. And it's less effective when you have the constraint for the ceiling heights that we have in the refurbishment. So when you say there'll be exactly the same characteristics, I would take issue. I think it's it, it would definitely be common ground that we would renew the systems. I don't believe it would be as efficient as the new book. Mr. Sturgis, in his rebuttal, also looks at this issue of the exterior um, and the, the potential for um, some, some changes to, to that part of the building. I'm looking at 3.8 of his rebuttal. Yeah. You, will, you, you will have looked at this. Yes, yeah. The, yeah. Anything in there? I mean, I didn't get the suggestion from your evidence in chief that there was anything here which you took issue with. Uh, there is clearly work to be done at the back of the building, but it's something that is feasibly done within a refurbishment scheme and would improve the quality of the building. It would. The difficulty, I completely agree with that. The difficulty is not in forming the windows, and, and, and Mr. Sturgis has denied this. The difficulty is there are cores behind those facades and risers, and you need to take those away. But physically, you can do it. It's not going to be low carbon, it's not going to be cheap, it may not be viable, but physically, you can do it. All right. Identity and facade retention at uh, 3.9. Yeah. And, and Mr. Sturgis fairly accepts that 3.9.7.1, that the issue of identity is not as simple to resolve with three buildings as with one, but he thinks there's a solution whereby one could have the entrance hall to the refurbished offices on Orchard, Orchard Street, just as proposed in the new build, mm -hmm. with a similar size to the new build entrance hall. And then you have essentially cosmetic local remodeling of the facade to improve the presence. So, OK, you're inevitably going to say, I know already Mr. Thorgrove <laughs> is not going to look as fancy as a new build scheme, but plainly there is a, an achievable, more attractive option 
which could be secured pursuant to a refurbishment scheme in relation to the identity, this entrance hall that is existing. Uh, you anticipate my response. Um, what do we know? We, we, we know that the, the, the payment width, although it's going to be increased by the OSD works on, on Orchard Street, provided, and it's an important proviso, the, the refurbishment scheme is viable, I don't believe it is, mm -hmm. if it's viable, it can pay for those works, right? Mm -hmm. But let's take as common ground that, that happens. You still can't set the facade line out to the uh, to, to the front of the uh, overhang because you don't get enough payment bills. So you have a recessive uh, office lobby elevation sitting below the underhang of 23 Orchard Street. Qualitatively, that's very significantly worse than what we're proposing because what we're proposing is a wide footway open to the air. Uh, a, a, a lobby that is a metre taller, that is more generous in dimension, with clear connections to a glaze lift and an atrium. I'm not going to agree with you that that's the same thing or has the same value. <coughs> I think, indeed, for example, in McCarter's uh, analysis of, of, of the site and the office development, it doesn't represent the flight to quality that's critical for value and critical for, for meeting contemporary tenant needs. So, I mean, I think you sort of anticipated my response. No, I don't think it's good enough. OK, so not good enough, not not the same value, not the same value, but nonetheless, with creative, innovative architectural input, a high quality uh, solution to this particular issue could be achieved in a refurbishment scheme. It's not been. I, I don't see that. I think your, your, the physical constraints of the, the existing building, the pavement with the frontage, I think they will bear on the quality of that office lobby, and I think they will bear on it negatively. Um, I mean, I think we hear one another. I, I'm not persuaded that that is a solution. I absolutely entirely accept that, that Simon thinks it is, um, but I don't, I don't see it. We're going to take away the pavement width considerations in your presentation yeah. and think about them. Yeah. The same goes for the loading bay. Good. The yeah. thought has been put into that by yourself. We're yeah. going to take that away and think yeah. about it. Right. Um, the retail and the basement issue of 3.11. Yeah. Mr. Sturgis's proof. This is, yeah, this is the, where there's some consideration um, of the the blind facades um, and how they could be opened up. We're going to look at all that. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. I mean, obviously, we don't we don't depart from anything that Mr. Sturgis has said here. Um, sure. We still maintain that it would be possible. And of course, the point that Mr. Sturgis makes is that you wouldn't necessarily. I mean, we'll look at the robot, <laughs> but you wouldn't even necessarily need to get rid of the undercroft because there would be options. You could improve the lighting. You could open up the facades. There are improvements that could be made. Um, but perhaps we'll just park the option of the road widening and come back to it. Um, similarly, with public realm uh, 3.12, I think would it be fair to characterize the dispute here between you're not saying that you couldn't deliver public realm improvements in a refurbishment scheme. You just don't think they would be of the same caliber, quality, or benefit as a new build of scheme. Well, I first of all start by making the statement, which is uh, echoed in Westminster's uh, Oxford Street uh, Place and Delivery Strategy, that the existing isn't good enough. And we're probably common ground on that. Not good enough on, on, on Orchard Street. Yeah. And I, I like Mr. Sturgis's description of the underground as unpleasant. I think I have that right. Uh, not good enough on, on ground or place. So do nothing is definitely unacceptable. Now, I've outlined what we can do with the new goals, 770 square metres of new high quality public realm, new permeability, uh, new public space, uh, greening, new street trees on Orchard Street, trees on Portland Mews, trees on uh, ground or place. Um, all of that relies on being able to 
really set the facade line, so an additional minimum of meter and maximum of four and a half meters of width. You can't do that in the refurb, I think you'd agree. It relies on being able to move the, the, the service yard. And again, I think that's very tough in a refurbishment. You're going to review and come back to me on it. Um, so uh, and, and I think if you look at Mr. Zerges' proposals, he doesn't seem to think you could deliver the east-west permeability and in turn switches it through all sorts of street. Well, that cuts off all of the connections to Selfridges. You know, and it was interesting, it was noted yesterday, so supporting our proposals, and they really like the, the, the permeability and the connection of Sir Christopher's Place through to uh, a Granville Place Garden. All of that only happens if you can make the link east-west, and it doesn't appear that that's possible in the context of uh, um, at least Mr. Sturgis is uh, uh, view of life. So I, I, I don't know which bits of public realm improvement are delivered in a refurbishment. We agree that there's urgent need for change. I don't see it being delivered in the sketch that we, 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 we put in. But just to clarify what Mr. Sturgis's position is, he says at 3.12.2.1, subject to more detailed analysis, it might also be possible to introduce the link more. Orchard Street to Granville Place, and he's not saying it can't be done, but obviously, well, it's very things. sensible, which I think you would do in a refurbishment, which is to say, if I've got an existing center core, I've removed all the out cycles, but I don't want to remove the middle core, right? So that I treat as a fix. Oxford Street's going to be retail, so my office entrance is going to be on Orchard Street. I think one of the tricky bits is I'm trying to connect an Orchard Street office entrance to an existing core. And hey, that's just where I wanted to put the arcade. So the arcade severs those two elements and they need to be linked. In the new building, because we're able to place the core in a way that facilitates that east-west link, we can deliver the link. And, and I'm sort of, at least with the drawing that Simon made, which made a lot of sense to me, I don't think you can in the refurbishment. Did that make sense? I'm sorry, I was doing well, that quite quickly. If we just to clarify. Parking for a moment, the feasibility of it. Yeah. There's a, there is, of course, a separate question about how important it is yes. to have this link. That's yes. a completely yes. separate question. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really a question of adding judgment as to whether really you need this East West link or whether the significance of it has been overstated by the applicant. Um, that's a separate question. I'm sure that will be considered in the planning evidence. Um, but. And I'm happy to talk to that if that's of interest. <laughs> well, I'm sure you would. I'm, I'm not going to give you the opportunity, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, the, the position I think we've reached in relation to the consideration of refurbishment, I think we could perhaps what I propose to do now is just to run through a couple of general points in conclusion. Um, because I think going through the various different examples, we've now got a bit more of an understanding about what the nature of the debate is between you and Mr. Service. The first, just the, the first point in relation to <coughs> overarching points. You accepted that um, I think you said you say otherwise orally here now, but on the written material in the in the DAS, um, you only looked in any detail at the light touch refurbishment option and the facade retention option, both of which we agree, you, you and Mr. Sturgis agree, not sensible options. Is that correct? I think we, we I think I hope I have this correctly. Recall, you'll have a note of it. We looked at a wide range of options in the feasibility, yeah. but in the DAS we set out and described two in more detail. Yes, and, and yeah. so we have your evidence orally of that, but there is no evidence written down of any consideration of um, a deep retrofit scheme of the kind that Mr. Sturgis is talking Not necessarily identical to it, but of but that kind. How of would you think? Care to, I mean, the 16 axonometric views, I took you to the lower right hand one with, uh, with vertical extensions. You wouldn't characterize that as a study of, of that option. Mr. Pilbury, you saw that earlier on in the DAS there was consideration of what your feasibility study concluded. 
And there was a specific paragraph talked about light touch refurbishment scheme, yeah. specific paragraph that looked at um, the option of desired retention. But you don't see a uh, textual analysis. I'll, I, I, I'm going to park the question yeah, okay. of the 16, the 16th option in your diagram. Yeah. But in terms of the actual analysis yeah. in the DAS, we don't see consideration of the comprehensive fifteen yes. the Sturgis system. So the number of yeah. schemes in the 16 which are not developed and sitting here today, I'm happy to confirm to you that yeah. I do not believe that heavy cut and guard refurbishment mm -hmm. is viable, delivers either MS's needs or the needs of the site. And that was not different than the conclusion we made in 2018. Mm -hmm. Next point, you agreed that your key criteria or your objectives for assessing the feasibility options um, did not include, um, if I may call them sustainability objectives uh, that look at the whole carbon, uh, the carbon cost of, of the scheme. You looked at the sustainability, we agreed that in the second objective, you looked at the sustainability operationally, but you weren't looking at whole life carbon and uh, the retrofit versus new build issue at that time. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. We looked at operational carbon and MS set uh, ambitious sustainability requirements for us, which we will we will share in the in the brief. I think we are more knowledgeable and better equipped to assess embodied carbon now than we were in 2018. We have better tools to do that. However, that doesn't change the conclusions we drew robustly in 2018 that the Refurbishment, whether it's light touch or deep cut car, would be viable, mm -hmm. would meet MS's operational requirements, or would meet the needs of the site. And, and, and with respect, I think I can be open. The refurbishment is so far away from meeting all those goals that uh, 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 that conclusion hasn't been changed by greater study of operate of the embodied carbon. We are looking at a very low embodied carbon solution for the new building, and we are focused on that, and we're drawing on lessons from previous projects, and I'm sure we'll continue to improve the numbers on that. Mr. You, Fraser, we, we seem to be going around in circles a little bit. Are you nearly through? I am, sir, yes. I'm just trying to recap, as it were, so I'll, I'll, okay. I, I, should, I shouldn't be more than about five to ten minutes. Okay. Um, the... The, one of the questions, one of the questions on the basis of all the evidence that you've given, the evidence that Mr. Sturgis has given, one of the questions for the inspector will be to conclude whether the applicant has sufficiently prioritised and explored the, the refurbishment option before deciding to demolish. Do you accept that's, that's something the inspector is going to need to grapple with? Yeah, yeah. Um, And it would also be open to the inspector, having looked at all of the evidence, your evidence, Mr. Sturgis, the evidence and others, it would be open to the inspector on the evidence before him to find that the applicant has not shown their scheme to be the most appropriate form of development on this site. I know that that's not what you will be inviting the inspector to decide, but that is possible. He could consider the evidence basis of Mr. Sturgis's uh, material and, and find that because there's not been sufficient consideration of refurbishment options, the applicant has not proven that the scheme is the most appropriate form of development on the site. I think in his <coughs> remarks yesterday, Mr. Harris characterised the position in a way that I entirely concur with. We have a viable deliverable scheme that secures M&S on this site in the long term and delivers the site's development capacity. Or we have a very, very uncertain selection of potential refurbishment options which definitely don't meet M&S's own requirements, definitely don't meet the requirements of the site, and are highly unlikely to be viable in my professional opinion. So they remain what was your phrase? A maybe. I think there are maybe with me 
signaling as a very significant element of, of, of doubt. I mean, I, I, I don't know what uh, you, sir, will do with that choice, but that is as far as I see the choice that you have in front of you. It, it, Thank you very much. At the moment, I have no idea. <laughs> we'll carry on. Mr. Fraser, is that uh, you done? Uh, a few more questions, if I may, sir. I'm, I'm sorry to be afraid to trouble you with that, but um, um, I want to just understand, because a lot of the answers that you were providing in relation to specific examples of issues yeah. to do with the refurbishment. Is your approach to judge a refurbishment scheme against the exact same design standards that you would judge a new build? The, the purpose of that question is really to just understand the inevitable difference between a new build where yeah. you're presented with a blank canvas, yeah. you know, as, as an architect, yeah. That yeah. designing a new build plainly because yeah, yeah. You're, you're starting from the beginning yeah. from scratch is, is easier. Yeah. In the words of Charlie Baxter yesterday, yeah. it's easier yeah, yeah. to do a new yeah. build. So, so inevitably, when one is considering refurbishment, there are constraints, there are obstacles, there are things which yeah. clever architects need to go away and yeah. think about yeah. and yeah. resolve. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th that's a fair characterization, isn't it? I think it is, yes. You simply yeah. cannot judge yeah. a refurbishment scheme on the, against the same design standards, quality standards, as you may well judge a new build. Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I think it's a valid question. And I think, for example, in Kensington, you get some peculiarities. So, you know, as I characterise it, it's got a regular grid, but it's not a perfectly regular grid. And you'll see, because we wanted to make a well-proportioned exterior renovation to Kensington High Street, that at one point you can see a column misaligns with a window. And that's an acceptable compromise because the basics were right. And of course, we want to build on the basics. Now, I don't think the basics are right here with the three buildings at 458 Oxford Street. And I, we don't, I won't I'll be brisk on that. But definitely your point is a valid one, that an element of compromise is inherent in refurbishment and appropriate, but there's a point where that compromise becomes unacceptable. And I think we cross that line here and cross that line quite clearly. Well, that's the judgment call for the inspector. But my judgment is we cross the line and we do it clearly. And the judgment call isn't is the is the refurbishment as good as the new build? It's are the compromises that are inevitable in any refurbishment acceptable in this case? Yeah, that's and the I'm question. Saying no, but you're saying no, you're, but, but, you're but saying. I think that you make that judgment, and you make that judgment differently between a refurbishment and a new build. I concur with, but there is a judgment still about whether you you're delivering something that's fit for purpose. And, and here, if you hear me, I'm, I don't think you do. Just building on that then, and this is my my last my last question. So if you feel with me, um, insofar as we're not looking at a comparison of is it as good is it as good, but simply are these compromises <laughs> acceptable? The question we're thinking about is can a refurbishment scheme create a building which is suited to the requirements of the site, the operator, and achieve significant public benefits. Um, and it's not a question of, is it going to achieve the same level of public benefits as a new build? But is, is, is it going to pr provide significant public benefits? Is it going to provide sufficient public benefits? Um, to... So do you see the, the point? It's not yeah, a yeah, question yeah. of as good in terms of public benefits or more suitable, but <coughs> is it suitable? Does it provide some public benefit? The, the, the public benefits delivered by the new build proposals include upgrading the quality of public realm on Orchard Street. And for reasons I've explained, I don't think that's achievable in the context of refurbishment. If only for the simple reason that we're moving the facade back to create an the pavement with. I don't think they're achievable in terms of Granville Place and the transformation of, of that because it's constrained by, by the servicing and it's constrained by the inability to deliver the critical east-west link that connects us to, to, to Selfridges. I don't think this is good, by the way, on urban greening and, uh, and the Oxford Street frontage. It clearly doesn't deliver m and on the site, everyone's accepting that, 
I think that's a big public benefit. It's also a heritage benefit, the one that Alex referred to in his 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 evidence that actually MS on Oxford Street is part of Oxford Street's DNA, part of its character and character of its place. And in losing MS, we lose those aspects. Yeah, we might keep the building, but you don't get the retailer. And that for Oxford Street more generally is, I think, a, a very significant problem. I think it's a question of fact that you don't deliver the same quantum of uh, employment in that space and you only have to look at Westminster city plan to see how important these what minority 22 percent of sites that are not in conservation areas how important those sites are to meeting that objective so public benefits in terms of employment in terms of retail in terms of place in terms of the public realm and in terms of the actual operational efficiency of the building None of those five get delivered by a refurbishment, in my view. One possible conclusion the inspector could reach is, OK, fabulous scheme, congratulations, very nice new build scheme. But I'm not satisfied that a deep retrofit scheme could fail to achieve significant public benefits and be suited to the requirements of the operator. That's a perfectly feasible planning judgment that the inspector could exercise. Hearing all the evidence, isn't it? I know that's not your view, Mr. Pilbara. No, I struggle. I struggle with that a little bit, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, 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 I really do. I, 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 do. I think we've demonstrated that the benefits, which are critically needed benefits, and they're identified in Westminster's Oxford Street District Place and Delivery Strategy, are delivered by the new bill. I do not believe they are deliverable by the refurbishment. I mean, I couldn't be clearer, and I don't see. I mean. Look, you said we'll make your own judgment, but I can't see how you make that judgment. So I, I've gone over, gone over an hour and a half. I think I was an hour and 45 minutes. Thank you for indulging me. Mr. Pilbara, thank you very much for answering my question. Thank question. you. Your questions are very curious. Thank you. That's quite all right. Uh, is there anyone here who spoke against the uh, the scheme who has any questions? Mr. Harris. Uh, just one or two points, please. Uh, Mr. Pilbara, if you go back to the beginning of my learned friend's cross-examination um, and uh, early days, uh, we know that uh, the NPPF uh, exhorts um, developers uh, to engage early with local authorities as part of pre-application. Yes. Did that happen in this case? Yes. You said in a direct answer to a question from a learned friend that as part of the pre-application, uh, engagement with the local authority. You explained your position in relation to refurbishment. Uh, is that correct? That is correct. I, I don't think that the pre-app documents before the inquiry, we can put them if, if necessary. In, in terms of both the council and the GLA, what was their position in terms of the principle of demolition and redevelopment at the pre-app stage? It was supported of it and I qualified Mr Fraser that we presented a new build as our preferred development route and they appraised that, that preference. We didn't go with the question should we do a refurb you feel or should we do a new build? We didn't feel the refurb met the needs of the site nor did they meet MS's needs. Orally. Then it said orally that you identify the deep retrofit but the 16th option in the um, design and access statement uh, as something akin to uh, the deep um, uh, refurbishment explained now by SAVE. Um, do, do you stand by that suggestion uh, or not? It's not identical to the no. scheme. We did look at some core removal, we did look at a scheme which removed every core and as I've explained I think that has consequences in terms of carbon and it leaves still unaddressed the, the problems of the three existing buildings. Thank you. And uh, when you, I think you dealt with this in chief, I don't ask you to put the slide uh, uh, <coughs> back up. Is it is it correct to say, as part of the analysis throughout, that you only ever considered, because it's being characterised as this, you only ever considered two potential options? No, no. see, we looked at the 16. Well, okay, we'll come back. Actually, we looked at more than 16, but we summarised 16. Right. Then you were taken to the GLA um, uh, position. You, re you remember the uh, stage two addendum. 
and that's CD413. We can get it up if you if, if you like. It, it might be just as well to do that so very, very quickly. And uh, we see this was a reconsideration of the stage two uh, report as a stage two uh, addendum. Here it comes. Uh, and there were two reasons for the reconsideration. Uh, the first was the newly published um, <coughs> London planning guidance on whole life carbon and circular economy, but also uh, the Simon Sturgis report. And uh, the inspector can note that from uh, it's CD 1413 from paragraph 6, 7, 8, yeah. 9, yeah. 10 and 11, they report, do you have that, sir? Yeah, I did. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11, they actually report Mr Sturgis's very detailed uh, objection, including all the points that he takes here, uh, if you like, to themselves to see whether it makes a difference. And in terms of uh, their conclusion, please, as to uh, uh, whether sufficient consideration had been given to a retrofit or not, it's in evidence in about 500 places, what's your recollection of what that um, conclusion was? The, the proposals were judged by the planning policy and uh, worthy of their support. Thank you very much. Now, on the very last day that proofs could be exchanged, we had what's now become uh, title of the Sturgis option put before the inquiry <coughs> in rebuttal. I just want to explore, please, um, uh, wait and various other things with you from an architectural point of view. Um, do you understand SAVE to be accepting that there's a need for an additional office use as well as retail or not? Yes. I don't think that's an issue. Let's think this through then. If offices in these buildings with their constraints are simply not deliverable. Is the Sturgis option deliverable? Thank you. Let me look at what the evidence is in relation to market and various other things. And I want you particularly to bring to uh, bear your experience at Kensington in relation to this, please. Start with offices, because you asked a lot of questions about um, uh, office standards, and it was put to you that the, the, the retail floors are capable of meeting that. We'll come back to that in a minute. Starting with offices, can we pick up, please, CD 10.4, which is Chris Goddard's uh, appendices. And can we go to appendix five? Yeah. You refer to this a number of occasions. Yeah. Yeah. And again, Chris Goddard can speak to and be cross-examined on this, but I just want uh, your understanding from an architectural point of view as to the deliverability of the offices, yeah. having regard to the constraints that you've identified. Yeah. Yeah. The constraints that we uh, looked at and you were asked about were columns and floor ceiling heights. Mr. Harris, I'm having trouble opening this. I had this before and I've saved it somewhere else and I can't remember where. But if you can just read out the. Yes, um, I will. Um, so this is the report of um, uh, Ian McCarter. Uh, as I say, uh, Mr. Goddard, as a surveyor, can speak to this, or, or we can call Mr. Carter if, if that's not uh, appropriate. Uh, it's section two, executive summary. Yeah. 203. I think you've already given this evidence, but yeah. the, the modern office is no longer seen as a place just to work. It performs a far greater function. Employees have grown to enjoy some elements that were experienced while working from home during the pandemic. It goes on. So, uh, 207, this is from the market experts in the office market in the West End. Based on our in-depth assessment of the site, the reuse of the existing premises for officers cannot meet the needs that are required of a modern office. The issues are so fundamental in our view that any refurbishment of the existing building cannot address the main and inescapable structural issues, which include, but are not limited to, its floor to ceiling height. Is that consistent or inconsistent with your experience <coughs> in the market generally, but at Kensington High Street? 
cross-examination of Mr. Fraser, we were taken to the BCO guidance, and quite correctly, it pointed out that the refurbishments, lower ceiling heights may be judged acceptable. However, if you look at that guidance, it says the deep plan of this floor plates, which is what we're proposing here at, at, at Oxford Street, for the very good reason that that's what the market sees. 2.8 to 3.2, we're delivering the 3.2. So the BCA guidance says we want greater ceiling height that would be delivered within the refurbishment. So I think the refurbishment fails to meet the requirements of the market. Thank you. He goes on to say, inescapable structural issues with the building which include, but are not limited to its floor to ceiling height, column grid pattern and its consequences, and the disjointed nature of the three floor plates and its resulting spaces. Well, column grids, I think we spoke about at length, and I, I won't repeat it again. You know, you've got very tight and irregular grids. In fact, they misalign, it exacerbates those, those individual problems in each of the three buildings. Um, I think you could, if you demolish all the cores, you've got the centre core at the heart of the I think then part of the column grids, you've got an open floor around that edge. I have some concerns about the floor ceiling height, I've, I've outlined them. I have some concerns about the fenestration, particularly on, on the Orchard Street extension, where the windows are frankly inadequate from the depth of floor plate that they serve. Um, but physically, you could make that problem. He then goes on to say, any variation involving refurbishment to this inherent and inescapable constraints would not be delivered. These constraints mean that even if it would be possible to find an occupier for the space, the rental levels would be so low as to mean that no reasonable developer would consider it viable to undertake such a refurbishment, and there would be no lender willing to finance such a development. Yes, yeah. is that consistent or inconsistent with your experience of the office market and the other office refurbishments that you've done? It's consistent with it, and I think we haven't spoken about it at length, but there is also this issue that's a very large quantum of space, and that's good, large floor plates in Westminster are sought after because they're rare, but then you think about an investor coming to the site, the three buildings are very discordant, the identity isn't clear, the front door isn't good. So I do think there are a series of qualitative issues that also burden the refurbishment in this specific circumstance. Thank you. Uh, to say you rely at all on any market evidence to contradict this evidence, which we submitted six weeks ago, after my knowledge. All right. Thank you very much for that. In terms of retail, uh, we looked at um, columns and floor heights um, up, up and other um, constraints. Can we please look to see what the market evidence is in relation to that? We need to go to Appendix 3. Okay, so I'll read it out. Thank you. This is the evidence from Nash Bond. Um, yeah, I have read it. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, sir. Um, some of these documents have taken awfully long, and this will be one of them, taken awfully long time. Well, no, I downloaded them all onto my oh, did you? laptop onto the hard drive, because well, otherwise they do take it. It's time. Chris Goddard, um, um, appendices. Yeah, so I'm making notes. I can look at it again. So, can you remind us who Nash Bond are, please? So, so they're specialist retail agents, and uh, um, they will praise the Oxford Street market and do depth and character and demand for retail space. Thank you very much. Um, and again, they've got um, a summary and a set of conclusions. Mr. Goddard will speak to these. But if we turn to section 10 conclusions, my analysis of the existing building is clear. Their shortcomings are so significant that they are simply not fit for purpose to any modern retailer requirements. The overriding structural shortcomings are the low inconsistent ceiling heights across both ground and basement floors, together with the high density of structural columns. This, in my view, is one of the leading barriers to entry, which will deter a feasible reletting of the existing building in whole or in part. Now, if that's right, the uh, is ours better than yours? Is it a matter of degree? Does that arise if the building simply can't be let for offices and can't be meaningfully let as a refurbishment uh, uh, for uh, uh, retail purposes? Well, I, I, I would defer to Andrew's experience, Andrew Bond's experience on the, uh, on the retail market, but the quality of space is certainly extremely compromised. And we walked the site yesterday together, so you will come to your own view, sir. But, but to me, the, the interior is chaotic and highly compromised. And I, I, I can't 
caliber of retailer that will move in. I, I think you've got some idea from the observation on, on the ground for the LS. Thank you very much for that. Last question. Um, flexibility of future use was put to you as a matter which was relevant to um, sustainability in the land. And um, flexibility of future use is featured in a number of uh, recent decisions. For example, um, this inspector, concrete lift shaft. I remember it. Was it a concrete lift shaft for all time or did it have a flexibility of use? Inspector said no. So let's compare that situation, concrete lift shaft, concrete lift shaft, whatever in the future, no alternative use. Is that a criticism that could be aimed at the proposed redevelopment? Is it and does it have a flexibility of future use? The two of you are a little ahead of me. This is referring to Don't worry what it's referring to. The <laughs> so the answer is yes. Yes. Long life is loose fit and the ability to accommodate change. It's fundamental to what we're doing as architects. So we want to provide provide generous dimension, good floor floor to ceiling heights, open uh, structural grids, we want to provide the connectivity, we want to plan for change. I think that's what we mean when we talk about a long life building, and that's a very important contribution the building makes, because it wants to have a 120 year life. Thank you. Long life is loose fit. Yeah. Let's assume for the moment that the sort of um, evidence that we've heard about uh, the Sturgis redevelopment not being feasible, deliverable or viable. Just put that aside for a moment. Right? But if you have to do all the things that we see Mr Sturgis doing uh, in the document that he sent to us in terms of the um, exchange of evidence, would you describe that as loose fit? In other words, if you had to do a comparison between the flexibility for future use of the redevelopment compared to uh, that the compromises, to use my learned friends, that are uh, learned friends words, that are necessary across the scheme in order to do the Sturgis scheme, which is the which is the more loose fit, which is the most flexible. E building provides greater flexibility. Why? Because it's got greater spatial generosity in terms of floor ceiling height, a more open structural grid, a consolidated core at the centre of the plan, optimised fenestration. Um, all of that will allow uses to change and develop over time. Thank you. Uh, uh, and if those experts are right and, and the uh, refurbishment doesn't get built, what contribution does it make to the meeting of the spatial strategy, which is the primary sustainable uh, uh, tool in the London Plan toolbox? None whatsoever. I mean, I think the great worry is that because I don't think the level of intervention that's being contemplated as necessary. And I, you know, I think that again, that's for me the most surprising thing about the, the, the Sturgis proposals is that it's like a quarter of the building needs to be to be changed to bring it back into use. Uh, if that's not viable, I don't think it is, then the most likely alternative is a do nothing scheme. The gas boilers continue to chug away, the energy uh, that the building belches out at the moment continues to. Chair, and I think that's a real possibility, and I think it's a very, very worrying one. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Those are our questions from the next time. Thank you. I have, I think, about six pages of questions, but I think I'm down to about six because mm -hmm. I've crossed most of them asked. Um, So um, you touched on this, but if, if you could just sort of summarise it for me, um, how is the choice of materials and things like consideration of sustainability? We're looking to minimise the embodied carbon for the new building's construction. And drawing on our earlier work at Edge London Bridge, we're proposing uh, post-tension concrete yeah. with a high cement replacement content. Um, Currently, we're contemplating GGBS as that cement based on content, but um, base. Sorry, I'll do that slowly. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm familiar with my cement replacement, but yeah. not 
the acronym you use? GGBS, GGBS. Um, which is a byproduct of the, the steel industry. And, and it, it's uh, a, there's a finite quantum of GGBS. So we are looking, for example, on the edge building with our main contractors base and other cement replacement options. Um, the technology here is moving very fast. And I mentioned on edge, we reduced the embodied energy from stage two, where we are today on Oxford Street, to stage three by 20%. Um, concrete's great, and, and, and post tension concrete is good. It's very efficient, it's very slim, gives us maximized clear height. The one drawback is that it's not so flexible in terms of making connections through it. You make a hole in a post tension concrete floor in the bank. So we ally that to structural timber. We've done that on edge. We've gone through all of the very formidable regulatory challenges on using structural timber. That's both persuading the London Fire Brigade and Health and Safety Executive mm -hmm. that it's safe and persuading insurers that we can buy insurance. Again. But we've done that. We've done it on a 28 story building. So I'm pretty confident we'll do it on, on the 10 stories that we have at, at Marble Arch. Um, and it's, uh, it, it combines itself low embodied energy with future flexibility to allow tenants to make connections between the floor. And we've been strategic in placing those where we feel it most likely that those connections would be would be required. Um, so that's the, the superstructure of, of the building. Um, Can I just throw your notes so ground granulated blast furnace slag. And it's a byproduct of iron smelting that otherwise is not on a tip. Add to that because we are moving to electric arc furnace source steel, the supply of GGBS uh, is finite. So, also, we need to find other solutions, and uh, the industry is looking at those. Is there any, um, is there any trade off between using replacement and the strength of the concrete? Well, very interesting. So, it's stronger than ordinary Portland cement. Good. But yeah, it but, takes yeah. longer to cure, so yeah. it affects cycle time. Now, that's to be honest with you, more of a challenge for us on the edge building because it's 28 stories than it would be at Marble Arch. And basically, uh, you have to accept a, a, a longer time to come to strength 28 days, and therefore, there's a slightly negative impact on program. Okay, okay. Um, thank you for that. So, in your um, in your brief, you've got a, a couple of sketches, including one on page 94, I don't know if you need to turn this thing up, but it shows a really lightweight, almost translucent corners. Do you know the sketch I'm talking about? Yes, an earlier sketch. Uh, yeah. And it sort of shows the, 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 the sky sort of almost <coughs> through the corners, but the end result's very different. Yeah. And I can take you perhaps the following page in my brief, which is 96, where there are a selection of, uh, of TBIA views that yeah. we compared uh, with, Mr. with Dr. Neely. Uh, that gives you a sense of how the corners will appear in the, in the, yeah. the It's a timber structure, um, and the timber itself speaks of the use of structural timber throughout the building, um, but it's also carefully detailed, so it's not a flat. Uh, plane structure, but it's one where the, the build-up of the timber structure is celebrated in the socket of the building. Right, so a couple of points on that. The, <clears throat> by moving from something translucent to solid timber, it becomes much heavier. Yes. Um, how, and how would it work? Uh, well, it's protected, so it's a socket. We wouldn't use timber on the, on the upper surface. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would probably take you to the uh, Stratford Olympic Park and Michael Hopkins Velodrome. Yeah, to look at right to see how timber on a soffit condition weathers over time. And I, uh, I, I was there recently, and it's looking good. Um, the The, you talk about uh, 855, employment space not delivered on the site will either be lost or be provided in locations of lower public transport accessibility. So to be clear, are you saying that um, the fact that this is such a sustainable location um, 
mean justifies uh, the additional carbon. Yes. Okay. Um, and so there's a couple of assumptions there. The first um, is that actually there is sufficient demand for offices yes. following the pandemic and working yes. from home. Yes. I don't know if you want to say anything about that or whether that's for the future. Yes. Ian McCarter would give you uh, an agency view. My experience on the edge building is we're seeing significant tenant interest in taking space at the highest environmental credentials. Uh, I mentioned Brianna standing well platinum. And there is, as Ian says in his evidence, a flight quality. So I'm very confident that the right calibre of space meets the dumb, a demand. I mean obviously yeah, you I, I don't wasn't, <coughs> sorry yeah, of course. I wasn't questioning the demand. It was more the um the, the, the demand in this area. Yeah. But more overall. Um, I mean are you suggesting that if you don't provide the offices here they would be provided in some other less sustainable location. That's the assumption that. Yeah, that I, I think getting. there's demand. I mean, if you look at Westminster City Plan, as I'm sure you, you've done, so, well, you'll see a demand predicted in the, in, in the so I think, 67,000 uh, jobs in the uh, in the CAS within Westminster in this site. Again, to go back. Within that 22% that's not conservation area, yeah. this site has an obvious and logical role to meet that demand. We're very confident that there's demand for office space on this site. I, I, I don't question that. But yeah. My point was that in terms of carbon, yeah. you were saying um, it, it justifies the additional carbon here because it's such a sustainable location yes. and it, it reduces the carbon elsewhere. Yes. But have you any evidence that other offices would be built? Elsewhere, where they'd be less sustainable if the overall demand for offices is reducing this slight point. I, 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 it's beyond my uh, expertise uh, to, okay. to, to guide you. I've raised it and I was going to think about it in the meantime. Um, Claire. This moving into the to the entrances. Um, understand the, the, the theory of this and, and the images and so on and so forth. Are, are there examples perhaps that you can point me to? Right. I suppose I was starting with Mr. Burn at, 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 at Selfridges and mm -hmm. at that full height recessive 12 meter bay subtly marking out the, the center of the uh, Oxford yeah. Street frontage. Uh, Doing that slightly differently, it's a contemporary reinterpretation of the same device, but effectively it's saying, where are the points of access? Where do you come into the building? And for me, by the subtle inflection of the facades either side of the cleft, walk up North Audley Street, walk south in Portman Square, the entrance is pretty clear. And, and proportionally, I think it does some useful things for us in terms of giving good balance to the overall street elevation. I'm probably not answering your question. If you'd like another example of a cleft. Uh, well, if, if you had one that's sprung to mind, but that, that will do. I've got one, if, you, if, if I might. I mentioned an Oxford, a, a little library I did in Oxford, uh, which, which um, uh, the Royal Bear American Institute, yeah. and there we have a recessive entrance with an angled uh, Portland stone wall that directs people to the entrance. Perhaps I can send you an image. An image of that would be good. Um, yeah, the um, in your rebuttal, you talk about concerns of the impact of the corners in relation to suffrages. Mm -hmm. um, because of the clefts, partly it's much deeper. Mm. Uh, and first of all, I wondered why the cornice doesn't follow the building below and above, and why you deliberately made it uh, much deeper. And, and secondly, it's on a slightly higher level. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Differences. Can you tell me about those. Firstly, the cornice sets, the front edge of the cornice follows the, the side boundary. So um, often if it is characterized as over same, it doesn't actually, but it's more that the rest of the building recesses. And as the building recesses, 
the cornice is providing a valuable environmental role, which is to shade the, the, the glazing of the test we were speaking about earlier. So it, it protects it from, uh, from uh, unwanted uh, solar gain. I think it also makes a strong relationship to the entrance. It's sort of framing, uh, think of it as an architrave around the around the, the, the entrance of the class so of grand scale. It's it's providing uh, delineation to to those points of entrance. I think the building is quite carefully. I remember the subject of detailed discussions we have with Mr. Pendleton at, at Westminster. I think the building is quite carefully designed to the way that it's seen within the townscape. So the cornice continues the, the top line of selfies, if you will, the top of the entablature, and that visual connection is important to approaching for marble arch in the west because you can see a single line uh, of building between the two. And in views as we've been discussing coming up from Bond Street, the, the, the building does not intrude into the, into the uh, silhouette of selfies. Physically, the two buildings are not, and you can see this on the model, the, 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 the new building cornice, as you point out, is taller than Selfridges, but equally the building is further recessed, it's further north than, than Selfridges, which has the nice effect that you see very prominently, the corner of Selfridges coming up from Marble Arch. So in perspective, the two buildings either align coming from the west or our building is, disappears and coming from the east. I, that was a rather long answer, but I hope that made some sense. Uh, it does, and I'll look at the model again quickly, if that's in, in mind. Um, you, you also talked about various pre-application um, discussions. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't include a design review plan. No, correct. And Westminster doesn't have a, a design review function. I mean, we were involved in de detailed discussions with the very capable officers both here at Westminster and with the GLA. Um, and that was the process that, that we, were, we were undertaking in, in the application. Soon to alter though, I think. Design review panel soon. Over my dead body. <laughs> One in Hammersmith and one in Camden, and I'm strong believers in them. Right, okay. <laughs> I'll ignore the voice of um, You talked about, you, you, yeah, you expressed concern over the, the, the gridded, uh, repetitive facade. Um, uh, two, two, maybe we'll step back. And then, This might be Mr. Forshaw's end. So, no, um, you, you wanted to avoid a, a, a remorseless elevation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But the, the cleft on the Oxford Street elevation yeah. is a long way over to one side, yeah. which means that there is a considerable length of, of elevation there. Uh, why is it not in the more central position, as with Oxford Street, um, with a, a better balance? There are both functional and architectural answers to that question. So let me do the functional first. So the the, the entrance uh, connects you into the MS, but importantly, it also connects you on to the ground floor place guard. You may recall of that sort of flying through we did, but yeah. you come to that entrance and you see ahead of you a wonderful green garden space. So I think if you put the entrance in the center, you'd be simply directed to the uh, to the core, which I think is less you probably find reminisce, but less good in terms of public public uh, permeability. And, and you're saying you, you couldn't move the position of the guard? You, no, you couldn't move the position of the guard because that's where the building is, so that the, 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 the core is. Okay, and the architectural answer? Was that I think that the equality of the corner, so standing on North Orkney Street and looking to the corner of the development, the balance between the range on Oxford Street and the range on the southern part of Orchard Street was important to us compositions so and we wanted to match those two dimensions. Um, 
You said that you would not have designed it in the way that it has if it weren't designed for Paul Marx and Spencer. Mm -hmm. um, and for the Thomas, of course. Yeah. What, what aspects of it would have been different if there was any thought that it was a speculative development? Um, I think the, the retail would have been, and you could probably look to examples in the former Debenhams and the former House of Fraser, the retail would have been more modest, so ground and lower ground wouldn't have extended up to the, the first floor. I think the, the ability to know that we were dealing with a single retail demise on the ground floor was really important to the way we thought about its relationship to the arcade, its relationship to Water Street, so you have a sense of um, permeability. Imagine that this was a standard retail offer, probably a demise in a series of smaller uh, shop units on that site. You wouldn't have that sense of uh, ground floor permeability. Um, there was a lot of work off stage about the functional efficiency of the new store. We, we saw how poor the existing one was. And you, as you could imagine, it was a very on top of like, how do we connect service yard down to consolidated storage and back up to the three levels <coughs> of, of, of retail that, that's offered. So a lot of the kind of detail building planning uh, comes out of that, uh, out of that work. Okay. Um, that. The uh, basements. Julia Barfield has obviously I listened to very carefully. Yes. Um, and others have said that there's significant embedded carbon in the right. basements. Yeah. Um, you're just by the lower ground um, as the food hall uh, for me, but the floor below that, you talk about showers and bicycles. Why, why could they not go on a higher floor near the offices and, and save a, a floor of the basement? Well, I mean, what the basement is doing is, is effectively addressing all the back of house needs. Of, of the building. That is guestly, the cycles, the showers, the mockers. Um, it's also the plant that, that, that services the <coughs> And I think fundamentally we've got a choice here. We, we could put them at, you know, we then be at grade. Um, and the difficulty is that these are rooms that don't require windows. They tend to be quite private and internal. And um, what does that mean in the public realm? You're looking at blank elevation. So we want to push them down and out of the way. And that's particularly important in the context of the MS floor, of course, because as we've been talking about, MS is brief as explicit, no floor more than a floor away from the entrance of Oxford Street. So we need the lower ground floor for retail space, provided also a ground first. So there is, I think, a really critical role for the basement to provide back of house stuff that you don't want to have tuckering up the upper floors. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Right, we'll take um take a short break. And do you know roughly how long you'll be in chief? Um, no, no, no more than an hour, hopefully a bit less. So then that's splendid. Um shall we shall we just adjourn to a quarter to four? Yes. And so um We'd be asking you to sit there again, yep, that's and I'm for the same reason. Okay, the fire is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.